Before I joined the BYI, I didn't really know much um, orchestral repertoire, and I didn't think that I'd, that would be my type of music. You're constantly with people who are probably better than you, and you always want to get up to their standard. You're expected to play your part as if you're a professional, and you're expected to, to do the practice, and if you don't do it, it's not good enough. But you get to interact with people, you have to work together as a team. There's all kinds of things going on when an orchestra's playing. It's something that you want to do, like you want to strive to be better than you already are. Pines of Rome is an extraordinary piece. It's very demanding in every department, and yet the overall effect is extremely powerful and very exciting. But it really makes serious demands on players in all the sections. The woodwind are stretched. The brass are extremely stretched. Percussion have a huge amount to do, and the strings, it's very tough. And you've got to put it all together. And it's the process of putting it together that is so exciting. It's wonderful. You know that with young people who are there because they want to be there, that they'll give you everything they can. And it's that commitment which is so wonderful to work with with the Youth Orchestra. And Brighton Youth Orchestra is very special in that respect. Listening to an orchestra live gives you something that you can't possibly, apart from anything else, you can see it. It's dramatic. An orchestra, it's a dramatic vehicle for delivering music. You've got all these wonderful, in our case, young people. If you notice how when young people are really intent on something, their eyes sparkle, it's, it's true. Brighton Youth Orchestra was founded in May 1949. It originally was started by the borough of Brighton, so it belongs to the city. It was the first local authority youth orchestra in the country, and it caters for young musicians uh, really across Sussex, but mainly from the area of Brighton and Hove, and is the orchestra of probably the highest technical musical standard that meets on a, a weekly basis in Sussex. The standard is grade eight for, for the majority of the instruments, quite often post grade eight standard. Could we just start figure 18, please? Onto here. Figure 18, straight in, please. 
Figure 18. I always think it's amazing that we rehearse for three hours on a Friday night and we have a really good turnout of teenagers and the attendance is really good and you know they're, they're not reluctant to be here at all and they must be getting something out of it. He really knows what he wants for the orchestra. He knows in his head kind of how he wants the orchestra to sound and what they're capable of. And I think sometimes for all of us at the start of term particularly, that can be quite daunting. We don't all necessarily share his vision. Can you play a B? Just play a B. And everyone there is always working hard. Like you don't find that in many other places, I don't think. Like I've done lots of other music in other places and in BYO, there's just a set of people who are always working really hard to, to like together as a group of people. First rehearsal, it's always a bit manic. No one knows what they're doing. Everyone's sight reading the piece. It's pretty awful. We really need that part really badly. Okay, could you have a look at it? Quite a lot of times I've surprised myself because I've just sat down and looked at a new piece of music and thought, no way, no way can I do this. On more than one occasion, we've got to the end of the first rehearsal and a few of us have looked at each other and thought, oh, Andy's not going to do it this year or, or we're not going to do it this year. You can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. That's cheapskate. <laughs> One more time. Come on. In various parts of the world, the first violinist, the leader, is often called concertmeister. And his role is incredibly important. He's, he's not just responsible for the violins, but he's actually responsible for the orchestra. All string players look to, to the leader. So it's not just about being a kind of figure at the front who's, who's someone to kind of see and look at, but um, it's also about you know, knowing your section as well. You can't just sit at the front and play all the right notes and expect to everyone else to follow. You've got to engage with other people in the section and the whole orchestra. He's very modest, very hardworking, and also really good at motivating people around him. You have to be quite personable to play an orchestra, you don't just sit at your desk and you know look at the look at the conductor, look at the stand, and just plug away. There's all there's all kinds of things going on when an orchestra's playing. There's people look, sharing glances at each other, especially with the leader Ollie Turvey's excellent for, for that. You've got to really understand the people you play with in your section, have a section that plays all together, not just the bows moving at the right time in the right place so it looks good, but also to play the right level of sound, the, the amount, the dynamics have to be together, everything, all the notes have to be perfect if you can. Well, in the violin section, you have 15 other people playing with you the same melodic line, and you, both, you all have to be playing in the same dynamic, the same volume, with the same kind of articulation. So you have to be a very active listener as you're playing. It's, it's a question of multitasking. It's sort of like choreography. If everyone is exactly the same part of the bow at the right time, the sound is much fuller.
clarinets, please don't come in at the same time as the bassoons. You come in two bars later. Wicked fraud. Have to count. Okay, never mind. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, don't forget that when it says come un lamento, like a cry, could you give me going almost away afterwards? Here we go. And, uh, and. Okay. He is genuinely passionate about getting the orchestra good. It's not something, he, he's obviously professional, he works at various music colleges, does all these other things for the rest of the week, but he still actually cares about BYO. I think it's his way of showing that he's, he, he cares as much as you do. He's not trying to um, uh, make you play well so he looks good from that point of view. He wants everyone to be really good. Okay, could I just have the people playing the top? Play it a little bit, a little bit less. And he's very much a person where he, he's like, oh, everyone matters and, um, you know, every, every single person you can hear and it's important that you play. And so he tries to make it so that we feel really important and special in what we're doing. Just play the top. Everybody play the top. And, uh, okay. I would suggest third position, second finger going to a first finger. And, oh. Uh. Okay, at the moment I'm getting this. La, ya, da. Can it long, 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 going away. Three. What a difference. Now put the bottom note in if you can. And, uh. What a difference. For a full symphony orchestra, and in Pines of Rome, it is a full symphony orchestra we're talking about. We need uh, to cover all the instruments, and we need quite a few of several instruments, especially violins, violas and cellos, and double basses. If you are missing any one section, you, you do have problems, and working with youth orchestras, there are obviously, in certain years, you get strengths and weaknesses in various areas. So you have to choose your repertoire carefully, but also fix holes where there are holes and you fix them by, for example, if you haven't got Roman trumpets, Buccini, as in Pines of Rome, what we've done is, and uh, purists will throw up their hands in horror and say, you can't do that, but we are, we're using saxophones. Well, I think it really works well. It's a, it's a lovely sound, and I, I, I love having the saxophones there. And we've got several players who, who play the saxophone in addition to other instruments. She starts, then it's the ten, middle, and then it's the top. Helen, I think we'll probably hear you on, on the film. I think we'll probably hear you talking right through that everything. Please. And even if it wasn't, could you stop it, please? Yeah, Andy can be a little bit tough. <laughs> um, but I think uh, he's not, it's not a personal thing, it's just because he's so passionate. Um, and he comes, I don't think he, come, he means to come across tough to you as a person, but as in, 
I think he knows that we can achieve more. So he knows that you can be better, he knows that you can always improve your playing. Could you play that considerably louder there? So he'll push you and that is a good thing. I mean, he's a conductor but he's also a violin teacher and obviously so he's learnt from experience how to like get the best out of his pupils. Um, I know it's tough for you. If you could blow your socks off at 22, please. You need to be stretched. And I don't mean stretched by outside. I mean from the inside. You want to be there. You want to be part of this great piece of music. You want to be part of everything. So you go for it. disagree that any of the pieces we play are above our level. I think that kind of attitude really uh, forces younger people out of things they want to do and kind of puts them down a lot, especially just in creative subjects. Like it's always not, you're not intelligent enough or not clever enough yet. You haven't had enough life experience. I think that you can get just as much out of young people as you can out of an adult orchestra. Yes, it's true. What we could at times do, we could give them a very easy piece. We could train them like monkeys to perform it and then uh, present it on the world stage as, look how clever they are. That is not musical education. That is training parrots and monkeys. It's not working. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And he's very frank. I've played with him with, in um, orchestras with adults, and the way he treats them is no different to the way he treats us. All you've got to do is copy me exactly, and so that the Bettini can go right back. In that it's, his, it's his attitude, attitude towards now. us that is the reason for how we play and how well we play. What does he expect of us? I think just to try and add as much detail as what the composer would want. He likes it when we try and put across our own kind of um, musicality and our own uh, contribution to the piece as well. When we look at a piece of music, you see dots. But dots are no more than words written on a page, which when you're doing a play, they have to become a real situation. To be or not to be. To be or not to be. It just doesn't wash. It's a question about whether you really want to live. Do you really want to live or not? Do you? Sadly, we have to stop there. Can I just th say, I know I keep on asking you to do more and more. I really respect the fact that you turn up week after week, that you give your time voluntarily, and that you really want to play great music. And I think it's wonderful. I think it's what makes the world go round, and I think you're fantastic. But please do the work that goes with this. Thank you very much indeed. Performing, uh, and it doesn't matter what venue it's in, whether it's a, a really small little church or whether it's, you know, the Brighton Dome or something like that, you get the same feeling of excitement and nervousness. You're really nervous, but it's really exciting and you just can't wait. There's a kind of tension in, in the air. It's quite scary, but it's quite exciting at the same time.
You've done all this rehearsal for a reason, and the concert is a chance you've got to get it right. To know that your work actually makes a difference, not just for you, but also for everyone there, is, I think, is quite motivating. People who are willing to, to join an orchestra, which can seem quite intimidating from the outside, playing with this music is quite hard and it's quite, sometimes quite obscure. If someone's proved they can join it and apply themselves in that, I think it's a good reflection on them, the future. And I think if, you've got a, if you can approach it with an open mind, you'll be able to do that in later life when an opportunity comes up. You're constantly with people who are probably better than you and you always want to get up to their standard. And that's why the orchestra becomes so good because there are always people striving to be good. It's like healthy competition, maybe, I don't know. The youth orchestra is musical education at its very best, of course, because it's, it's real. The performance you know, you don't stand in front of people and say, sorry, I'm only little, but I'll play you the best I can. You play to the best of your ability and you make no excuses for it. The amount of transferable skills in music is incredibly high. Any studies you, you, you look at that start talking about people playing classical music, to people playing in orchestras, people playing in amateur groups, anything, as long as you're working on it and actually trying to do it properly and trying to improve, improve every single different area of cognition you can think of. If you play music, your mathematical ability is increased a lot especially mental maths. In sitting there counting bars or adding, adding bars up or intervals or everything, it uses parts of your brain that improve all forms of cognition. If you're playing on a woodwind or brass part, you're probably the only person on your part. And if you get that entry wrong, at double forte up in the stratosphere somewhere really high in the instrument, there people are gonna notice. And being able to keep your brain working and not seize up and manage to work with the people there to make sure you're all in tune, you're all coming in at exactly the right time. You might know the music off by heart, you might even you know, know it better than you know anything else, but you still have to be able to fit in with absolutely everybody. It's a kind of a level of concentration that you can learn in music that I don't think you can learn anywhere else, really. Andy has probably been the single biggest influence in my academic life and also my play, uh, playing academic, same thing really. A few years ago, there were some pretty terrible things happened in my life. And if I wasn't in Yorkshire, that, that would have been pretty catastrophic. And I, I would have definitely not been doing music. I mean, I would have never been able to think in the right way, 
in the right professional way. If it wasn't for Andy, I, w I, would, I don't know what I'd be doing really. It'd be something completely different. And not necessarily, if the orchestra wasn't around, probably not very good either. It's about playing with other people your age, playing with your friends, because, you know, I don't just come here to do the music. I, I love the music, but I also come here to meet my friends as well. You build really strong friendships with the people in there because you've got so much common ground and you share such a, like, a love for the thing you're doing and, you know, to be in an environment with 70 other people all doing the same thing that you all love is, is really beneficial. Some of the players in the youth orchestra will uh, undoubtedly go on to sort of forge careers in music and that, that in many ways sort of sets the, the scene for, for, for the rest of their lives. For others, you know, music will be a, an important part of their lives. It's not only the musical foundations that it, that it sets, but I think it, it sets a, a real a real sort of social, social sort of network really that, uh, that, that can last for, for a lifetime. Um, the Pines of Rome is, uh, Pines of Rome is, um, well, it's a, it's a musical piece. <sighs> I'm not really sure what it's about. I, I know that I can't remember what it's about. I'd say it's a piece of music, it's based on a story. Right, you've got to need more than that. <laughs> You're not going to let me get away with that. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a huge amount of trombone part in it. The Pines of Rome is a kind of miniature symphony. It's about 20 minutes long. Well, 20th century, really. Early 20th century. It's like sort of impressionism a little bit. I don't really know. But it's, it's quite clearly telling each movement is part of this story. It's about in ancient Rome with all the Roman Empire. And it's about all these different pines. Oh, uh, some. I can see that. All, the, all these captured slaves coming back to, um, back to the, the empire with, um, with all the Romans and stuff like that. I'd like to say something. And the last one is this big triumphant, I don't know what it is, celebration of this. The last movement is about the Appian Way, which is the main road that goes into, into Rome. And it is, it's descriptions of, of landscapes and, and things within Rome. So you don't have to expect to hear exactly a melody as we normally hear for a Beethoven symphony or for a Brahms symphony, of course. Boom, boom, boom. And that, that carries on all the way throughout the piece, right until the end. And it's just this huge, huge, massive, great build-up. I want to say that we pass from very, very soft and intense moment to very fast and more interesting tempo in the music. So it's quite you just need to close your eyes and to listen to it without any prejudice from the end, from the beginning to the end. That's what I wanted to say.
At the end, you come out with like a, a really good performance and you feel really good about it and you create something really interesting as a group of people. Doing anything as a team makes you gel, but like especially playing music, I think. It's not a simplistic thing. Playing in an orchestra is highly complex, highly demanding, and you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and still find more, which is why the music is still around. final end of year concert is always amazing and where they've come from September to July is you know every year it kind of takes your breath away a little bit and makes you you know it's one of the best bits of the job. Being a youth orchestra conductor is as tough as any conducting. I feel very passionate about it. It's not entirely rational. I'm not pretending that this type of thing is entirely rational. It's driven by just loving doing it. It's not all down to the conductor. The conductor is only part of a team. Uh, uh, listen, listen. It's nothing.